Benjamin, and I think the students in both of my classes, Middle East and Women in World Politics, have heard my own expressions of disquiet and concern and anxiety about the state of the world today, and my concern about your generation, actually. So I think you have quite a stake in trying to make sure that uh, progressive posi po positive change comes about. Um, my generation has had it okay, other than the Iranian Revolution, of course, but, um, but for you, you really do have to take this seriously. So we're grateful to uh, Medea Benjamin and also to Cole Harrison for um, making this possible and, of course, the International Affairs Program and myself. I forgot to introduce myself to those who don't know me. Um, I'm Professor Mokadam, uh, Professor of Sociology and International Affairs. And um, once again, thank you for coming. And in particular, thanks to our speaker and guest, Medea Benjamin of Code Pink. So um, yes, let's go and um, help bring about some change. Yay. And then, of course, her most recent book, uh, co-authored uh, with uh, Nicholas Davies, um, War in uh, Ukraine, Making Sense of, the, of a Senseless uh, Conflict, which is the topic of, of the talk tonight. So without further ado, let's start. And welcome, Medea Benjamin. Well, thank you, Val, for that uh, very um, uh, embarrassing introduction. This is one of the most complex issues that I have written about. And you know, you also get very worried when you're writing a book on something as complicated as Ukraine, because you know you're going to piss off a lot of people on all sides. I mean, particularly Ukrainians who are fighting for their country right now. Uh, and then you're going to piss off people who uh, may be a lot smaller in numbers, but tend to be vocal in leftist circles who want to be cheering for Russia. And we've even found some of them on this trip so far. And uh, as you'll see from the video, uh, we walk a very fine line in the analysis that we're doing. And the video gives you the brief outlines. The book goes into a lot more detail on these issues. So we'll uh, show this video now. Uh, then I'll do some comments. And I look forward to your uh, comments, questions, discussion, disagreement, whatever. Thank you. Let's talk about the heartbreaking war in Ukraine and what we could do to try to end it. Every day the war rages on, civilians and soldiers are being killed. Millions of Ukrainians have been forced to flee and seek asylum in foreign lands. Schools, hospitals, apartment buildings, and infrastructure have been reduced to rubble. We wrote this book to try to help people make sense of a war that should never have happened, a war that has raged on for months and might well rage on for years, a war that could lead to a nuclear confrontation, a war that must be stopped. We know that people have very different opinions about this conflict, and we hope that our book and this talk will foster respectful dialogue. We have not tried to justify or excuse Russia's invasion of Ukraine because we do not think it is justifiable or excusable. We hope we can help you understand the context, the background, and the actions of all the parties that led to this crisis. As U.S. citizens, we have very little hope of influencing the Russian government, but we should be able to influence our own government, which is why it's so important to look at the role the United States has played in fomenting the conflict. Let's look at two elements of U.S. involvement that we highlight in our book, NATO expansion and the events of 2014. Western leaders call NATO a defensive military alliance, but NATO was formed to defend Western Europe from invasion by the Soviet Union. That mission was accomplished when the Soviet Union disintegrated in 1991. NATO should have been dissolved at the end of the Cold War, along with the Warsaw Pact, which was NATO's counterpart in the Eastern Bloc. Instead, NATO reinvented itself to justify its continued existence. It expanded all the way to Russia's borders, despite many promises that it would not do so 
and ignoring warnings from experienced U.S. and Western diplomats that this would lead to a predictable yet entirely avoidable crisis with Russia, has, as in fact it has. You can see the map showing the various waves of expansion in which NATO incorporated former Soviet republics and Russia's European neighbors. In 2018, the antagonism reached new heights when NATO, under U.S. pressure, publicly promised membership to the former Soviet republics of Ukraine and Georgia. While no definite date was set, NATO began supplying increased levels of military aid and training to Ukraine, including Ukraine in military exercises. So Russia certainly had legitimate concerns about Ukraine's involvement in an ever-expanding military alliance that was encircling Russia with powerful military forces and had already unleashed aggressive wars and occupations in Kosovo in 1999, Afghanistan in 2001, and Libya and Syria in 2011. The other event that served to set the stage for the Russian invasion in 2022 was the coup in Ukraine in 2014. The 2014 upheavals began with massive peaceful protests against the corrupt pro-Russian president Viktor Yanukovych. Unfortunately, though, these protests turned violent and were co-opted by neo-Nazi groups that refused to go along with an internationally negotiated plan for a political transition, and instead, they spearheaded a coup. The extent of U.S. support and involvement in this coup is still shrouded in secrecy, as are previous U.S.-backed coups in Iran, Chile, and many other countries. But a leaked audio tape of Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland and U.S. Ambassador Jeffrey Pyatt exposed their roles as coup managers as they handpicked what positions each of their Ukrainian collaborators would assume in the post-coup government. Although the original peaceful protests in Ukraine were about wanting to join the European Union, Newland dismissed the European Union's more popular choice for Prime Minister, Vitaly Klitschko, with her infamous F the EU remark. According to a Gallup poll conducted in April 2014, nearly 50% of Ukrainians rejected the legitimacy of the post-coup government. This led to rebellions in parts of Ukraine that were ethnically and culturally close to Russia. In Crimea, a peninsula on the Black Sea with a mostly Russian-speaking population that was part of Russia from 1783 until 1954, as well as in the eastern provinces of Luhansk and Donetsk. In Odessa, 42 anti-coup protesters were burned to death by a mob on May 2, 2014. The new government in Ukraine was rejected by the parliament in Crimea, and a referendum to rejoin Russia passed overwhelmingly and was accepted by Russia but not recognized by other countries. The provinces of Luhansk and Donetsk also passed referendums declaring themselves independent from Ukraine, leading to a civil war that killed an estimated 14,000 people. Many Ukrainian military units based in this region defected to the self-declared People's Republics or refused to fight their own people, so the Ukrainian government formed new National Guard units to fight the separatists. These included units like the Asov Battalion, recruited from the same neo-Nazi groups that took up arms to spearhead the coup in Kiev in February 2014. The worst fighting of the Civil War ended in February 2015 with the signing of the Minsk II Accord. This was drafted by France, Germany, and Russia, and agreed to by Ukraine and the self-declared republics. It set up a ceasefire in a buffer zone between the warring parties and was monitored by 1,300 monitors and staff 
from the OSCE, which is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. While the ceasefire largely held from 2015 to 2022, the Ukrainian government failed to implement the political aspects of the Minsk II agreement. It had agreed to grant Donetsk and Luhansk a new autonomous status, but each time the Ukrainian government tried to move forward on this, extreme right-wing forces re-exerted their power and insisted that Ukraine must instead keep fighting to recover its lost territories. NATO and the U.S. also bear responsibility for the failure of Minsk II. Despite officially claiming to support the agreement, NATO and the U.S., under both Trump and Biden, kept building up Ukraine's military, encouraging the Ukrainian government to believe it could eventually recover Donbass and Crimea by force, and that the U.S. and NATO would support that. As tensions were reaching a boiling point in December 2021, Russia took the initiative of drafting two mutual security treaties, one between Russia and the United States and the other between Russia and NATO. These were not take-it-or-leave-it demands, but drafts for negotiation. Unfortunately, the United States and NATO summarily dismissed Russia's proposals. By building up Ukraine's military, promising Ukraine-NATO membership, and dismissing negotiations, the U.S. and its allies turn Ukraine into a dangerous weapon in their revived Cold War against Russia. Then, in the days leading up to February's Russia invasion, the OSCE ceasefire monitors documented thousands of explosions around the ceasefire line in Donbass, mostly on the Donetsk and Luhansk side, indicating a major escalation of artillery fire by Ukrainian government forces. So even in the immediate causes of the war, it is deceptive to describe the invasion as unprovoked, as Biden and U.S. officials routinely do. By early 2022, Russia had amassed large military forces near Belarus' border and its own borders with Ukraine all the while denying that it had plans to invade. It also formally recognized Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics as independent countries. On February 24th, Russia invaded. The invasion was illegal on many counts. It was not an act of self-defense, and it certainly was not authorized by the United Nations. Under international law, including the Kellogg-Briand Pact and the UN Charter, the invasion was an illegal crime of aggression. Russia did not just move its invading forces into Donbass to support the breakaway republics, but it launched offensive towards the capital, Kyiv, and the second largest city, Kharkiv, in the northeast, and into the southern part of Ukraine from Crimea. Western analysts generally agree that Russia must have hoped to take quickly Kyiv and install a friendly government, but it encountered strong resistance from Ukrainian forces and was forced to withdraw from the north. Ukraine's western neighbors responded to the invasion by granting asylum to millions of refugees, while the U.S. and other NATO countries poured billions of dollars worth of weapons into Ukraine, stepped up their training of Ukrainian military, and provided it with intelligence to accurately attack important Russian targets. There has been little or no accountability for the weapons flooding into Ukraine. There are reports that as little as 30% of them may be reaching the front lines because they are either destroyed by Russian missiles or siphoned off into the black market where they could end up in the hands of the Islamic State, neo-Nazis, or other dangerous groups around the world. This was precisely why the U.S. Congress prohibited the transfer of U.S. weapons to the Azov Regiment in 2018 as it became a magnet and a hub for international right-wing militant networks. Yet after the Russian invasion, all restraints were lifted and thousands of tons of powerful and advanced weapons have poured in over the Polish border. 
There was so little debate about this in the U.S. that when Congress passed an enormous $40 billion package for Ukraine, with most of the money to be spent on more and more lethal weapons for up to another decade, not a single Democrat voted against it. Not even Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who cast the lone, wise, and prophetic vote against the disastrous war in Afghanistan in 2001. In our book, we explain the peace negotiations in Turkey in March that could have already ended this war and the largely unreported role of the U.S. and British governments in killing those talks. The talks during the first month of the war produced the contours of a 15-point peace plan for a ceasefire, a Russia withdrawal, and a future for Ukraine as an independent, peaceful, and neutral country. On March 27th, President Zelensky told a national TV audience, Our goal is obvious, peace and the restoration of normal life in our native state as soon as possible. Under the draft agreement, Ukraine would neither be a military ally of the United States and NATO, nor of Russia, with no foreign military bases or installations on its territory. Ukraine would get security guarantees from other countries. Russian speakers in Ukraine would be free to speak, read, and study in Russian. And the future of Crimea and Donbass would be determined by an internationally accepted political process during a transition period of several years. But none of that came to pass. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson went to Kyiv on April 9th and told Prime Minister Zelensky that the UK would not be party to any agreement between Ukraine and Russia, and that the collective West, as he called it, saw a chance to press Russia and was determined to make the most of it. Turkish diplomats who had been mediating the ceasefire talks reported that U.S. Defense Secretary Austin delivered a similar message to Zelensky, and that these messages effectively killed their peace efforts. So early hopes for a negotiated peace were dashed, largely as a result of U.S. and British determination to weaken Russia, even at the cost of rivers of Ukrainian blood, in an open-ended war that could last for years. The undermining of ceasefire talks was a tragic lost opportunity. Since the talks were abandoned, the slaughter and destruction has continued with hundreds of Ukrainians killed every day. Russia has taken control of more territory and despite the successful Ukrainian counteroffensive, Russia now occupies 20% of Ukraine. The sanctions against Russia have backfired leading to soaring energy prices worldwide, while reduced grain exports have led to widespread hunger, particularly in the global south. Europe is facing an energy and home heating crisis. Meanwhile, no sign has honestly or publicly explained what its goals are in this war, or why they can possibly justify the total destruction of Ukraine and even the greater danger of nuclear war. Even the old war hawk Henry Kissinger is warning that U.S. policy has blundered to the brink of a world war with no clear purpose or endgame in sight. He told the Wall Street Journal, We are at the edge of war with Russia and China on issues which we partly created without any concept of how this is going to end or what it's supposed to lead to. And here at home... We are told we don't have the funds for a decent health care system or free college education or housing for the unhoused. We cannot allow our public funds to be squandered on yet another unwinnable war and an even more all-consuming military budget. Governments in the global south are watching the impacts of this war plunge millions of their people into hunger and famine while Europe's energy crisis is already sinking the continent into a recession. We in the U.S. have been relatively unscathed by this war compared to many people elsewhere, but we are already facing rising prices which will get worse as the war continues, and the U.S. will not be exempt from the impacts of this looming global recession. 
With climate chaos jeopardizing the very future of life on this planet, this war is derailing our efforts to confront the climate crisis. Instead of a Green New Deal, we are now watching a mad scramble to produce more oil, gas, and coal as energy companies reap record profits from their disaster capitalism. And while the climate heats up and governments and corporations shift their already inadequate climate plans into reverse, Russia and the U.S. are threatening us with yet another existential disaster, a nuclear apocalypse. We understand that some people may disagree with our analysis of this conflict, but hopefully we can all agree that we must do whatever we can to bring this war to an end. And that's why Code Pink is part of a coalition called Peace in Ukraine. We pressure our members of Congress and the White House to call for negotiations. We call on the media to promote the voice of peacemakers. We distribute our messages via social media, and we educate the public, including getting our book into libraries and classrooms. And we encourage you to join us. We must act now to say, stop the bloodshed, stop the bombing, stop the madness. We must work together to demand a ceasefire and negotiations, not more war. Thank you. Oh, uh, we are viewing this conflict and leads to the question, um, where do we go from here? And uh, the way I see it is that um, we had big peace movements in other uh, times of great conflict like during the Vietnam War, and there was a draft, so young men of college age, uh, uh, right out of high school, were being sent over to fight and die, and so there was a, a very vibrant peace movement, especially among young people. Uh, then we had, more recently, the Iraq War, where we did have a lot of people who got out onto the streets before that war started to say no, uh, once the war started, that movement started to die down. And uh, when you had a Democrat in the White House who many uh, people that were part of that movement actually liked, Barack Obama, that movement fell apart. And for young people, it was hard to get them involved in the peace movement because uh, for those who were born after the 9-11 attacks, uh, war, the U.S. being involved in wars was just part of their everyday lives and didn't seem like anything particularly abnormal or anything they could do anything about. And at the same time, there are other crises of racism, of uh, student debt, and of course the climate crisis that are all extremely important issues that have taken uh, a lot of the energy of young people for, for good reason. And so we come to this point in our history where there is a war that the U.S. didn't technically start, although it did go uh, Russia uh, into this war, uh, and yet we don't have any kind of peace movement to respond to this. It's an issue that even people who would call themselves progressives or liberals have uh, had a lot of uh, uh, discussions and differences about the interpretation of this. Uh, it's been a time when uh, the uh, having a Democrat in the White House means that even the very progressive people in Congress have been reluctant to criticize uh, Biden. Uh, and we see that, as we said in the film, that there was a vote f about $40 billion. That's a lot of money, $40 billion. Uh, to go to Ukraine, $19 billion of which was for weapons, and there wasn't one Democrat who said no. And there were 57 Republicans in the House that opposed it, and 11 Republican senators. Now, they opposed it for a whole variety of reasons, some of which you might agree with and some of which you might not agree with. Uh, some of them said, we had domestic needs at home that have to be funded. Some of them said there's no transparency for how this money is going to be used. 
Uh, some of them said, we need this money to go to our border, to secure our borders from the hordes of immigrants who want to come in. Uh, others said, we're looking at the wrong enemy. The enemy is really China. So, you know, they were kind of all over the map in terms of what they were saying. Uh, others saying that this is going to fuel inflation, that's going to be hard for uh, the American people. But um, what it showed is that there are people on the right of the American spectrum, and sometimes on the extreme right of the American spectrum, who are carving out this issue now uh, to say that um, we cannot keep giving a blank check. And the $40 billion was not the only tranche of money that was spent. There's continuing ones. In fact, just last week, there was another $13 billion uh, that was passed uh, to go to Ukraine as well. And once again, there was no Democrat that uh, complained about that money. So it's a, a, a time when American people are now facing elections coming up in November. Uh, polls show that most Americans, their number one issue is about the economy, and many of them see a problem of inflation as something that is affecting their uh, standard of living. Uh, some of them are connecting this to the Ukraine issue uh, because it has uh, affected people all over the world, more so in Europe and in Africa, where they were dependent on either Russian oil or grain coming out from uh, Ukraine. Uh, but in the United States, the price of energy has gone up, the price of uh, commodities and uh, especially food uh, in, in the grocery store has gone up as well. And so there are a number of voters who are making this connection between the war in Ukraine and the increase in prices, the, the growing inflation. Uh, and then there was a poll that was taken by the Quincy Institute, which is an Inst a relatively new institute uh, that came together with money from uh, both the left and the right uh, spectrum in terms of uh, big foundations uh, to say that the U.S. had to have a less militaristic foreign policy. And the poll they conducted uh, just last week showed that 57% of Americans said uh, that they wanted to see negotiations even if it meant that, the, that uh, Ukraine had to make concessions to Russia. So there is growing sentiment among the general public about this war needing to uh, come to a resolution at the negotiating table, and yet we don't see that in the uh, leadership in the White House. We don't see it in Congress in general. I mean, there are, as I said, people in the Republican Party who are questioning it, but the Republican Party, uh, in terms of its leadership, is all out for continuing to fund this war. Um, the uh, minority leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, uh, said when the White House uh, asked for another $13 billion, his response was basically, that's not enough. So um, we have a real disconnect. And the disconnect is even greater when you look at the global scene because while uh, the majority of countries, I think, are criticizing Russia for its invasion of Ukraine, uh, they also are criticizing the West for fueling the conflict and for not calling for diplomacy. And they're also saying that this conflict uh, is directly affecting their people. And while other wars, well, certainly world wars affect the whole world, but in recent times, uh, there hasn't been a conflict like this that has had this global repercussions. And my colleague uh, that I wrote the book with, uh, Nicholas Davis and I, listened to every single speech that was given at the General Assembly at the UN uh, two weeks ago. And uh, we pulled out 66 of those speeches um, that spent some time, and they only get 15 minutes, so it's precious time they have uh, to talk about the Ukraine conflict. And those 66 were ones that uh, upheld this issue, saying uh, that this was an issue of desperate concern to their people. And they had a lot of different reasons for it. And one of them was the climate. A number of these countries are small island nations that have been so affected by the climate crisis and they, there was one who cried out and said, look, 
uh, you wealthier countries, you countries that caused this climate crisis, uh, you promised that there would be a global climate fund of $100 billion, and you promised to us this to us a long time ago, and you've never come through. And yet, if you add up collectively what the U.S. and all these other countries have spent on Ukraine now, it's about that. And, you know, he was crying out and saying, we need you to take the climate crisis seriously and to put real money into this. Um, there were also others that said, how are we going to come to an agreement at the next climate summit that's happening, what's called COP27, that's going to be happening in Egypt in November, if you can't talk to Russia and China, uh, the two major companies, uh, countries we need to come up with a deal for this. And so there is a global clamoring. We just saw the Pope come out with a very, very strong statement condemning Russia, but also saying to Ukraine, we have to end this crisis and it has to end at the negotiating table. We're seeing individuals like Donald Trump saying this has to be solved, this is affecting the whole world. Uh, he has even said that if were he president, this would not be happening. And one can imagine that he would be talking to Putin, whereas uh, Biden refuses to talk to Putin. And our Secretary of State, who sometimes you wonder, is this guy really supposed to be the number one diplomat for the United States, or is he really an appendage of the Pentagon? Because uh, Anthony Blinken has never said that he wanted to help negotiate this by talking to his counterpart uh, from Russia. On the contrary, he said, if we talk about issues, it will not be about ending the war in Ukraine. So we are stuck right now. And as American citizens who have to care about a potential uh, nuclear war, um, the mainstream media is not giving us any help either uh, because they are seeing this in a very one-sided lens and helping to sensationalize uh, the war. And the only rational uh, discourse we are hearing are coming from Fox News, people like Tucker Carlson, who has had very uh, amazing pieces in which it sounds like he is coming from a position that I would espouse. Um, we hear another Fox News anchor called uh, Will Kane, who just came out with a great piece. And the major thesis of it was, uh, is defending Ukraine worth risking a nuclear apocalypse? And I think that is a very key question. So if you look at where we stand, we have a government, a mass media, um, people that are supposed to represent us who aren't representing us, uh, and we have a population who is being fed a, a very propagandistic view of this, uh, uh, yet, en enough of the population is seen through this to start saying, uh, hey, we want to see some negotiations. And we don't have the peace movement out there that we need right now to be pushing this. And it's why we have Massachusetts Peace Action working so hard on this. It's why I wrote this book and I'm on the, on the book tour uh, to see can we stir up a new movement uh, that uh, really can call on our elected officials right now uh, to take the rational step. And one rational step is something that the head of the Progressive Caucus, Pramila Jayapal, uh, put forward in a letter that was so mild and thanking Biden for all the help he was giving to uh, Ukraine and yet asking for him to uh, push diplomacy. It was such a mild letter that many groups like my organization, Code Pink, didn't want to sign on to it because we didn't think it was strong enough. And Cole, I don't know if Massachusetts Pete's action, did you ever sign on to we that? You know, we all support the letter, but we did ask our people to support the letter because they all voted for arms. So at least the letter would take a position to also call for negotiations. You know, Ayanna Presley, Jim McGovern, generally pro-peace representatives, yet, yeah. They're on board for this war in Ukraine, and they haven't called for the negotiations. And they haven't signed this letter, which is put out well, by the Presley did sign, Presley but did but sign and McGovern, McGovern didn't, um, put out by a progressive caucus that has 100 members in it. And you would think you'd be able to get those 100 members. 
But um, I think the pressure is so strong on them coming from the leadership of the Democratic Party to say, you know, we have elections coming up soon, let's look like a united party, let's stand behind our president for this. And so, uh, you know, before opening up, I just want to close this part by saying that I think this is a critical time for uh, young people to stand up. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can talk about the kind of things you can do, and luckily you have an organization here in Massachusetts that you can be part of. Um, but this is a really dangerous time in our history. I often think, you know, how would I have felt and what have I, would I have done um, uh, as, as World War I was uh, starting to happen? You know, would I have, I would have had no idea it was about to happen. We have no idea where this is going. Could this be World War III? It could certainly be that. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, you know, we can't be complacent as we watch this happening. So I want to end here, uh, open to your discussions, and thank you very much for having me. Okay, uh, let's open it up. Um, any issues or questions or clarifications or agreements or disagreements? The question was, uh, why are the Democrats um, so gung-ho about supporting Ukraine in this war, right? Is that, uh -huh. and um, so some elements that I will throw out, but I would love for others to add into that. Um, one is that the Democratic Party has been very anti-Russia uh, mm -hmm. in recent times. There was the whole issue about Russiagate saying that Russia had interfered mm -hmm. in the U.S. elections, that it was their interference that led to Trump winning the election over Hillary Clinton, uh, and so there is a predisposition to be opposed to Russia. Uh, another is uh, that there is a, um, uh, uh, Biden has been very anti-Russia throughout his career. Uh, he, even when he was in the Senate and the head of the um, Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate, uh, he was very anti-Russia. Um, and uh, when you have a president that sets the policy, um, it is very hard for other people in the party to go against that, especially at election time. Uh, that's one element. The other is to recognize that we basically have two war parties in this country, the Republicans and the Democrats and that when it comes time to deal with conflicts, uh, both of them tend to look towards the military as the way to deal with that. And uh, one of the reasons is the tremendous influence that this military industrial congressional complex you know, has in our policy making. And some people say, oh, that's very conspiratorial way of looking at things, but it's actually, if you look at who are the people that run this government, you see their uh, direct connections with the weapons industry. So take the Secretary of Defense we have right now, Secretary of Austin, who you saw in this uh, video, who actually said we need to weaken Russia as part of our, our objectives. And he, before becoming Secretary of Defense, sat on the board of Raytheon and other previous Secretary of Defense have come directly from the weapons industries themselves. And then you see that um, uh, Blinken himself was part of a, a consulting group that got uh, um, defense contracts for different companies. Uh, you see that members of Congress are so mucked up with the weapons industries because they have so brilliantly created uh, this, their, their uh, factories, put them in every single congressional district, basically, of this country, uh, and then they uh, give money to the members of Congress, and the members of Congress vote for more money for those weapons because it's job creation uh, in their districts. And we could go into many other ways in which this uh, is a, a revolving door and a, um, uh, so much support that comes from government to those weapons industries. Uh, but they have a lot of influence and they make a lot of money from these wars. 
So that's another factor to include. But I'd like, I think it's an important question, so I'd like to open that up to uh, other elements that people might want to add to that very important question. Yeah, you know, when you mentioned that um, both political parties are the parties of war, I mean, they have been. Both parties were involved, for example, with the American war against Vietnam. Um, various administrations, and it was both parties. Um, so that's true, too. That's a very important point, mm -hmm. and I'm glad you brought that up, because what we're seeing now is how uh, the U.S. was very concerned that Russia was having a more influence in Europe mm. and just look at the pipeline that was bringing Russian gas into Germany and how dependent Germany had become on Russian gas and not just Germany, uh, so much of Europe uh, depended on Russian gas and Russian oil. And um, the U.S. energy companies didn't like that here at all either. So um, this was a way to bring Europe back into the fold of the U.S. to really tighten those links, uh, not only politically, but economically. And so you see producers of liquid natural gas here in the United States who are just reaping record profits yeah. and wanting to uh, find new ways to sell their products in Europe. And you see um, the uh, all of the companies that are benefiting from the sanctions that have been put on Russia. So it's an extremely important political and economic issue to bring up. Mm. Are there al other elements, just to wrap up on this one, other elements of why? Sure, and I think you have all the uh, reason in the world to be very, not only pessimistic, <coughs> pessimistic but cynical mm -hmm. about this government because, you know, we, uh, are taught that our government is the great model of democracy that has to be spread around the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of us didn't need the uprising on January 6th to teach us that this was not the mm -hmm. greatest model of democracy in the world. But now a lot of the rest of the world has seen uh, that this is not a great model uh, either. Um, and uh, yet we do have more avenues to influence our government than a lot of other countries do. I mean, look at Russia today. People go out on the streets to protest and they're hauled off to jail. Um, I mean, oftentimes that happens to us as well, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, this is a, a really extreme crackdown on uh, freedom of press, freedom of expression. Um, you have now people being drafted in Russia as they're calling up more in the military. We have more of a possibility to influence our government than uh, people in many other countries do, and we have to take advantage of that possibility. And I've actually been seeing that possibility shrinking, for example, not only from, since January 6th, um, uh, but also because of COVID. And mm -hmm. it's been an excuse to close down Congress from the public, to keep us, the public, out of public hearings, for example, uh, to make it harder to have access to our elected officials. And I think we have to push back against that. Uh, I think it's important for everybody to know who their congressperson is and to try to have some kind of relationship with your congressperson. You are really lucky living here, whether you are permanently here in Massachusetts or not, you're here now. And I think, you know, I'd like to give uh, Cole a chance to talk about the work of Massachusetts Peace Action and how people can get involved. Okay. We have a lot of interns uh, from uh, Northeastern. Well, so we are a group of uh, volunteers that came together, we, uh, our organization dates back to the 50s, trying to ban the bomb back when the nuclear weapons were first invented, and uh, we're still trying, but we have um, uh, 10 uh, volunteer-led working groups to take up all different issues. We have a group that takes up Ukraine, we've got one on Palestine, Israel, climate change, um, mm -hmm. Latin America, and so on and so on. So. Uh, we try to create small groups where people can, or manageable sized groups where people can come together, participate, get to know each other, work together, and try to make change. Um, so we invite you all to get involved. Uh, we have a number of Northeastern students as interns this term, uh, co-op students, I guess you call them here. Our next street action is a week from Friday, 
defuse nuclear because that weekend is the anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we think that the danger of nuclear war is as great now as it was in the Cuban Missile Crisis and has been any time since then. So there's rallies at congressional offices all across the country. I can't speak highly enough about Massachusetts Pizza Action, also known as MAPA, um, because I think it's the work of MAPA uh, that is the one of the reasons why there are progressives elected in this state. Um, you have some of the most progressive people in Ayanna Presley, in Jim McGovern, in Elizabeth Warren, and even in uh, Senator Markey. Markey. Who, um, yeah, we worked hard for Markey. And, and you all worked so hard. And that should be a, a reason for optimism because if you have well-organized groups that do effective actions, and even though they have to hold their nose working around in this system, uh, of, a, of two war parties, they do it, and they uh, get some of the best people elected, and those are the people we need uh, to carry our messages into Congress and to try to influence Biden. So I think it is a great example of how uh, activism does work when you are well organized. I mean, it really is tough to work with because we do have two war parties, and yet over the years, the Democrats have been a little better in general than the Republicans on war issues. But that is, that is no longer true yeah. on Ukraine right. and on China. And I think what's happened is that the U.S. really sees, it's really we're back to the Cold War. Yeah. That's really what it is. In the Cold War, even then, Democrats were thought to be a little bit better. But uh, now you almost have Democrats leading the charge to start up the new Cold War again. Uh, and even people like Trump saying, wait a minute. you know." So it's actually very weird, and, and, and those politicians that Medea rattled off are not with us on peace in Ukraine. But we hope that they'll get over their timidity and come around, because uh, otherwise it's very bleak. But it's like when they see what they call their peer con competitors, China and Russia, then they, they suddenly say, well, we have to confront those states. Those are awful states, and so on and so forth. You know, well, look, Chinese and Russians have a lot of problems. We have a lot of problems, right? So um, we have to get along with these countries. We don't, we don't have any choice. Uh, we may not like China's government. We may not like the Russia's. But that's, that's beside the point. You know, we have, to, we have to deal with climate change. We have to deal with democracy. We have a lot of problems. And, and those, we can deal with those countries. And it's just a lot of baloney, and the media is a, lot, a big part of it, of telling us a lot of lies that we can't even negotiate or talk to those people. Nonsense. Of course we can talk to them. They've already made, you know, even during the Russia-Ukraine war, sorry, I don't mean to ramble on. Go ahead. They've, they had a, they, they met, right, and they decided how to get the grain out, because both Ukraine and Russia produce a lot of grain. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so they, they had a problem, it was complicated, but they actually are sending grain out of that. Mm -hmm. Now they have a nuclear plant in a town called Zaporizhia in Ukraine, which mm -hmm. was under threat. But they, they had a talk, they had talks, and they brought in the UN inspectors to take a look at the situation and recommend how to make it safer. And they've had prisoner exchanges. There have been talks between Ukraine and Russia, but you still have see a lot of Americans who have been told, mm -hmm. you can't talk, talk to Putin. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Yes, you have to. Scholars, um, John Mearsheimer and uh, Stephen Walt, and they have a very interesting perspective on war and peace and a very interesting perspective that actually aligns nicely with Medea Benjamin's, even though they're not, they're not exactly in the peace camp, so to speak. But um, they do have a critique of um, the way the United States government has been pursuing um, this, uh, this issue of uh, the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, and they don't think that it is good for the United States. So it's, uh, it's something that you might want to look into. Um, Mearsheimer at the University of Chicago and uh, Walt um, here at Harvard. We created Code Pink right after the 9-11 attacks. And it was at a retreat of a group of environmental women saying, oh no, how is our country going to respond to this? It's going to use this as a justification to go to war. And already, that was during George Bush's time, he had come out with these color-coded alerts to say, today is a color yellow day, uh, code yellow day. It's a kind of calm. 
today is a code orange day. Uh, terrorists might attack. Today is a code red day. You know, be very, very worried. And they never told us what we were supposed to do. Code red, you know, hide under your desk, whatever, whatever. And we said, we need another color code alert. And we came up with the idea of code hot pink because we wanted to be something, you know, kind of out there. And yet it was a URL that was taken by a porn group. So we couldn't get that. <laughs> so we just became code pink, uh, which was tough for some of the women because they weren't like, ah, I'm not a pink kind of gal, you know. Um, but it's been useful over the years because it's a branding. It's kind of easy to brand. And um, our motivation was to say that we, as women, and we never excluded men, we always wanted men to be part of it. Ty was an uh, early supporter of Code Pink, um, need to uh, address this issue of massive militarism and how are we going to shrink the Pentagon budget and put that money into the real needs that I think your generation sees, the need for the, uh, to address the climate, the need for free college education, the need for a decent health care system. I mean, those are real needs that we have in this country. And so uh, our uh, goals has been, have been to try to stop conflicts from turning into wars, uh, try to stop the wars that the U.S. has been engaged in, and uh, try to shift that uh, skewed priorities to ones that really um, are, are things that benefit us. And one area that we've worked on a lot is around Iran, mm -hmm. to try to stop a war for, with Iran. And we were so excited under the Obama administration when there was an agreement for the nuclear deal and things started to open up with Iran. And it's interesting when people say that we can't negotiate with Russia because Russia was a party to that deal. And then Trump came in and pulled the US out of that deal. So a lot of people, and not only in Iran, but other places say, can you negotiate with the United States? Right. You know, they make Just a deal. Just in our Middle East class this morning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the, the motivation is, is, is to get people um, to be outraged by the skewed priorities we have and to get inspired and activated to do something about it. And so one of the things I think that has been a trademark of Code Pink over these years has been to try to bring some uh, music, theater, joy into our actions, into our work. Uh, it is something that has helped us get more young people involved uh, and to try to create more of a community so that people want to go out to these rallies, want to be together, uh, and want to try to grow the movement. I know that this is a, a time for the fossil fuel industry to rejoice because they just bombed a pipeline. They, they're calling now for more fracking, more uh, investment in oil, and uh, we're going to export it to Europe now. Um, so we see that happening. Um, but also, I, I just don't understand how the Europeans you just talked about, we spent three trillion dollars on these wars over the last 20 years. That's three times 1,000 billion in, in, in monies, right? So um, how, why are they accepting this war in Ukraine with Russia when they know it's gonna economically hurt them very badly, they're gonna have a very cold winter, they're not gonna have enough food. How does the United States convince its allies in Europe that this is a great deal for them? Well, it's a, it's a good question. And I think one of the reasons is that there has been a, uh, a fear of Russia uh, from the days going back to the Soviet Union, uh, a fear in Europe. Uh, there are many European countries that were part of the, uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, that felt yeah. that they had gotten liberated with the downfall of the Soviet Union uh, and um, are happy to be part of a, what they see as a, a freer uh, Western societies. Um, there is also uh, the fact that um, the, uh, there are, is a division in the West and there have been leaders 
in Germany, France, and Italy uh, that did speak out early on and wanted mm -hmm. to find a solution to this, um, put themselves forward as people wanting to speak to Putin and negotiate. Um, but they were quickly held back by the US and the UK. Uh, as part of the same, we have to be on the same page in the Western world, the free world. Um, I think this unity in, the, uh, in Europe is going to quickly fall apart as soon as winter hits. Oh. Oh. Uh, the, the richer countries in Europe are going to be subsidizing the high energy bills for uh, their working class, um, but that's not going to help all of Europe and all Europeans. And already we're seeing protests in Europe. Uh, we're seeing people like in the Czech Republic coming out uh, by the tens of thousands against inflation, uh, which they are relating to the war in Ukraine. Uh, we're seeing the extreme right coming to power in a number of countries in Europe, uh, including uh, Italy just recently and Sweden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that reflects what we're talking about here in the United States, is that the right is taking this issue on uh, and um, the uh, and working class people who are being hurt by the economic repercussions of these sanctions against Russia are looking for answers, just like people uh, look towards Trump in our uh, cities that had hollowed out manufacturing plants and uh, and a few prospects for uh, decent union jobs. So similar thing happening in Europe, and uh, we are going to see, I think, a change and a, and a breakdown in that unity uh, towards Europe and promises that European leaders have made to uh, uh, comply with the US and NATO in spending more of their money on military. You know, there was a goal that NATO had that countries had to spend 2% of their gross domestic product on the military. And there were groups like ours, part of peace movements in those countries that said, no way, that's not a goal for us. We want to keep our national health care system. We want to keep the free education that we have for university students. We don't want to go the way the United States has gone. And so they held back. And now um, it's been very hard for them to hold back. Mm -hmm. And countries like Germany have said, we're mm -hmm. going to put another $100 billion into uh, the military. Mm -hmm. um, and people are going to rise up against that. So mm -hmm. it hasn't happened on a large scale yet, but mm -hmm. I think it will. And, and I think, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how much, are we kind of wrapping up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, in, in wrapping up, I think well, you're living at a very, very historic moment, mm -hmm. a very precarious moment on the one hand, and when you say that it's a, a moment of pessimism for, for young people, I certainly see that. But it's also a moment of great opportunity to build a movement. And um, I think that we are on the cusp of building this kind of movement that uh, can say to the Democrat and Republican parties, this is not the way we want to go. We have to convince some of the larger movements that exist in this country, uh, some of them like the environmental movement, that have taken the wrong stand in this and, say, and gone ahead and say, yes, we want to sanction Russian oil and Russian gas, uh, and now are seeing the uh, consequences of that position. We have to um, get those environmental movements back in the fold with us on this. We have to reach out to the um, anti-racism movements and get them to see um, how uh, much of an issue this is about race. And many people have brought up a lot of racial aspects into how the Ukrainian refugees are treated versus refugees from other countries. Uh, how separate lines were formed on the border of Mexico <laughs> just for the Ukrainians to get in immediately into the United States while people have been living there for some of them for over a year. Uh, where we uh, can make alliances with people uh, that are coming from a more conservative side of things but are also s seeing this issue the way we are. 
Um, so I think it is a moment where you're going to be witnessing and can be part of uh, this very exciting new movement in this country and help change the course of history that instead of going into World War III, we actually could be on the verge of building up a very strong anti-war movement in this country that could confront the military-industrial complex. Yay.